الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلق أجمعين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب أنفسنا أبو القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى محمد وعجل وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Assalamu alaikum once again. Thank you very much for inviting me back. Um, the reason w- which w- I wanted to give this lecture today um, was actually it came from a conversation which I was having um, with a Christian man um, who I had had contact with over the years for a long, long time. And um, we, we didn't speak for a long time, but anyway, we got back talking again recently. And he's a, he's a, he's a pastor, you know, like a, a, a Christian scholar. Um, and you know a very very lovely lovable person you know um but he's he's you know he's always very keen to discuss christianity and islam you know he's come he comes from the maybe from the sort of baptist or protestant background where they're very keen on their you know um on on their kind of da'wah so they're always keen to discuss and they're keen to debate with muslims and so you know this was his approach and so we've been having this conversation recently and one of the topics that came up was a story of uh Adam alayhi salam and Eve. And so we were talking about the versions, uh, how this is found in the, in the Bible and how it's found in the Quran. And alhamdulillah, sometimes it takes something like this, it takes us being challenged before we actually pick up our own book, you know, and we actually look into depth, you know. And I, I speak to myself here before I speak to anyone else, you know, when I say that we've been given a book by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we've been told in over a hundred different verses to you know, afala yatafakkarun, afala yatadabbarun, afala yaqilun, you know, different ways of saying that do they not contemplate, do they not ponder, do they, do they not use their minds, you know. And subhanAllah, sometimes, you know, we take this book for granted, we just bring it and sometimes we recite, recite it for thawab, or we recite it at a wedding, or we bring it out for certain occasions, but we don't sit, we don't ponder, we don't look into it in depth, we don't pull it apart, we don't look at this, this, this word, we don't examine what different scholars have said, we don't debate it with our friends, with, with different people. And yet, sometimes it takes when someone, it takes someone to come along and challenge you and say, no, actually, I think you're wrong. I think what you'll find the answer is, is this. Actually, no, I think, you, I think your Quran is actually mistaken. You know, sometimes you need someone to come and say that to you before you actually go away and you start to examine in depth and to look at it, you know. And this is, alhamdulillah, this is the opportunity which I was given to actually start to look into this story. And obviously, I've only looked into it According to my only sort of, according to my own limited ability, so I, I wouldn't, you know, say what, what I, even what I what I've done so far is even a, an in-depth examination. But just from having, a, you know, just from having thought about the the the, the verses slightly, I've realised that there's so much benefit in this surah, um, in in sorry, not in this surah, but in in the story of of Adam alayhi salam um, and Eve, and the the story of how man came into this earth. That I wanted to base this lecture around it, wanted to talk about a few things about this about this episode. So, the purpose, one of the follow, one of the reasons coming on from that for discussing this topic is if we think about it, this is one of the fundamental episodes described in the Quran. You know, this is this is the first man uh, to enter dunya. You know, this is the coming down of man into this earth. And so there's there's deep philosophies here. There's reason, you know. There's there's reasons for why we, why, you know, everyone at some point asks us, why are we here? You know, what is the whole point in this? Um, and there's deep meaning in some of these verses where we talk about this. The other thing is, is as we'll go on to see, inshallah, there's very strong practical lessons in this surah because if we think about, you know, and inshallah, we'll, inshallah, we'll go on and, and to discuss in a bit more detail about this topic. But you know, in the school of Ahl al-Bayt, we see this as an educative process for Nabi Adam alayhi salam. This is the process through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala educated Nabi Adam before coming into this dunya and equipped him with the tools and the knowledge that he would need and experience. So there must be for us today as people living in this dunya, there must be important principles, important messages to take from this as well. And finally, um, finally, the, the, obviously the reason which I mentioned at the beginning, why I wanted to look at this and to look at it in a comparative um, way with the with the with the biblical account um, is that if you think about this, I mean, this is a story. This is this is a this is a, an an, uh, an account of an episode which happened when we talk about this story, which Christians believe in, Muslims believe in, and Jews also believe in. 
Muslims, we make up around approximately one-fifth of the globe's population. Christians, perhaps a third of the globe, pop, globe's population. Jewish Jews, obviously very small in number. But around, you know, overall we can say that more than half of the world's population, nominally at least, believes in this story as to how mankind came to be within this world. So it has to be of importance that we look into this and that we examine the reasons uh, given by the different accounts. So... Oh, and one story, one, fu one further reasoning um, is the fact that sometimes when you hear, you know, we find in the Quran um, that the Quran tells us that this book has come um, to confirm the messages that come before it, you know. It makes some big claims to come and say that this is actually correct what you'd find in the Old and New Testament. And so obviously this is a challenge which is out there in which many people, you know, volumes and volumes have been written about this topic, you know, um, with some people claiming that no, the Quran was just copied from the Old and the New Testaments and bits were added in and bits were, you know, there's many works saying this and obviously there's many works refuting it and inshallah when we'll see from from some of the, I mean, it, it, we obviously within the time frame we have here it's not going to be possible to go through a line by line and to compare all of the, all of the, de to, to, to go through all of the details coming out of the comparison but what we will see is that on an important, on a number of very important issues the Quranic version and the principles that come out from it are different to what we find in the Old Testament. Um, and inshallah we're going to explain it. Uh, and it's very, very important for us to understand, uh, to understand these differences. So the first point, um, you know, looking at this is we have to ask ourselves, you know, from this, what, what, what is the reason for our being on this earth? Why did we come into this dunya? And on this topic, Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah number 30, it's very important to note from the outset, from the beginning of this episode, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلًا فِي الْأَرَضِ خَلِيفًا Now, this verse is saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the angels, Surely I am making in this earth a khalifa. Now, we can go into a lot of detail about what this means, the responsibilities, the great position that mankind was given. But this is probably a topic for a different day. But for, for our purposes today, the important note to take here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inni, inni fil ard khalifa. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that we were made to dwell in this earth. The purpose originally when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us is that we would exist and we would, would reside in this dunya. Now this might seem like a, a logical or a very just, you know, a common sense kind of, uh, kind of, a sort of very commonsensical point. But as we'll go down and we'll see in, in, from, from the biblical account, it's not always clear from everyone's understanding um, that we were actually always intended to live in this dunya. So the next, the next ayah um, which relates to this is we have another ayah in uh, Surah 51, ayah 56 in the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبَدُونِ Okay, so this ayah is telling us that I have not created the man, uh, all of the jinn and mankind, except for to worship me. So we have to see that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is created in the earth, earth a khalifa, and he's not created this, this khalifa in the earth, except for to worship him. And we have other narrations, um, one which I mentioned before on a topic um, of tawheed and ma'rifah, where we mentioned about Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, where he spells out... Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. Where he spells out in detail how the concept of ibadah relies completely on us having ma'rifah, you know, of having a recognition and a cognizance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore we can deduce from this logically that our coming into existence, our being in this world, is a way for us to gain ma'rifah of Allah and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the highest way possible. And this is the entire purpose of our creation. And we were always supposed to come into this dunya, and this dunya was always supposed to be a means for us to achieve that goal. And this is of immense practical consequence for us in our lives. Because this should give us a sense of direction. This should give us a sense of purpose. I mean, how many people do we see in, uh, in, 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 in the world today, you know, wandering around without any sense of goal, without any sense of direction? And you know, people talk about the breakdown of the society, and people talk about the, the state we find the youth in today, and you're always reading these things in the papers, you know. But it's because, you know, so many people are just living with not really understanding, what, why, why am I in this dunya? Why, why am I having challenges? Why do I need to make money? Why do I need to do this? Why is there... If we understand the goal in our life in this way, then this is incredibly important in giving us 
uh, an impetus and a motivation and a direction to push us towards the right direction in our journey back to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, in, one, uh, in one narration of Imam Ali alayhi salam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He mentions that this earth, that this, that this dunya is like a bridge, you know, and that we shouldn't become obsessed with staying on this bridge, you know. This, this, this bridge is to take us on to something else. And this is just reinforcing, you know, the, the, point, the, the point that was made before, that we're only here in this dunya to gain the ma'rifah and to achieve this true worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, by way of comparison, I just want to mention uh, a verse from the Bible, um, from the Old Testament, from Genesis 3, verse 22. It says, Then the Lord God said, Okay, so following, um, sorry, before we go on, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, you know, I'm sure that everybody has a, has a general overview of the, of the story and the occurrences around what happened with, with, Adam, and Eve, with Adam and Eve. And the, 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 the big, you know, the, the main events are quite similar in the, old, in, in the Quran and in the Bible, but the differences are largely, in, there are some large differences, but main, most of the differences are in the detail and how the, the interpretation which can come out of that. So, in Genesis chapter three, Genesis three, volume, uh, verse twenty-two, as a result of of Nabi Adam having eaten from the tree, um, this verse says, "Then the Lord God said, Now the man has become like us; he knows good things and evil things, because he'd eaten from the tree of knowledge; he'd gained the knowledge of good and evil. Now he might reach forward with his hand, and he might pick the fruit from the tree that makes people live for eternity, forever. And then he might eat that fruit, so he would live for always." And so the Lord God sent man out of the garden that was in Eden. So we can see from this comparison, I mean, there's many, obviously from an Islamic perspective, we can see that there's many issues we have here. First of all, you know, with God saying that now man has become like us by account of eating the fruit. Obviously, without going into any details, that's something, you know, the idea of, of, of Tashbir, you know, this would be um, to go against the very fundamental belief in Tawheed. But without going into too much detail on that topic, one other point which comes out of this is the fact the reason why man was sent out from the garden. Why was man sent down into the dunya? And the reason given here is that there was a concern that the man would eat from the tree of eternal life. And so would not only become knowledgeable in the way that God is knowledgeable of right and wrong, but would also become eternally living, just like God as well. So for this reason, God throws man out of the garden and into the dunya. Okay, so... Obviously, without going back into all of the issues, there's so many issues we'd, we'd have with this whole understanding, the idea of man becoming like God in the first place. But if we just take the, if we just take the, 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 the fact here that as a, necessary, as a necessary kind of consequence of this, of this account, we have to believe that mankind was not actually intended for this earth. We were actually intended to live in the garden. But because, because Nabi Adam alayhi salam, a'udhu billah, made, did a sin, and disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to the biblical version, that actually mankind now lives in dunya and was thrown out to protect us from eating from a certain tree. And that all of us now, our entire lives, were not actually meant to be in this state anyway, but it's just all of a consequence from that original sin. Now, if we, if we correspond, if we, if, we, if we take a comparison with this, I mean, I remember as a child sitting in a church, because I used to go to a Catholic church um, when I was younger, I uh, went there for many, many years of my life. Um, and one of these things, I remember thinking that this, this story always seemed to seem more like a, a story to me. Not something which I would really hold on to and say, you know, this is the truth. Or this is something really which I could grasp and say, yes, you know, I, I can really, you know, my, my reason for being really can be hinged on this story. It was always sort of something a bit strange, a little bit interesting, something, you know, with some, some strange twists and turns. And this is because there's certain gaps of the logic here, you know. I mean, one of the reasons, like I say here, is that actually if we have this idea that the entire mankind was not meant for this dunya, it has huge psychological impacts. It should have a huge way on which we would think. Um, and the second, uh, the second idea which I wanted to discuss, um, which inshallah will be in a bit more detail, is going to be the concept of the sin or the supposed sin of Nabi Adam alayhi salam, um, and the concept of original sin, um, which we'll go on to explain in a bit more detail, inshallah. Now, the first point to note here is that as per the narrations of Ahl al-Bayt uh, alayhi salam, and as per the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam, we obviously we don't believe that the prophets alayhi salam sin. Not, you know, not small sins, not large sins, and not at any time in their life, not from the time before they announced the end of the board and not afterwards. So, 
this is the this this may raise this may raise certain uh, this may raise certain questions for some people in their mind because we read this and we read that Nebi Adam was told don't eat from this tree and then Nebi Adam ate from the tree and then Nebi Adam was went from the garden. So some people are saying surely this was a sin. Surely Nebi Adam salam, was then removed from the garden as a punishment for this sin. So how does our belief that prophets don't sin correspond to this? Surely this belief contradicts the Quran. Now, there's a few reasons here why it's clear from this verse that Nabi Adam salam, by eating from the tree was not committing a sin. Um, and the first one uh, the, first, the first one given by the Mufassirin is that after eating from the if, if, if we take if we take the, the, the first if we take the first example and we said that okay being sent from the garden was a punishment for the sin of eating from the tree then what happens after this is that we're told that uh, that Nabi Adam does istighfar and we'll go on to some more detail about what istighfar is but, but Nabi Adam asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cover over his act to negate it to, to cause it to have no to, to have no uh, ramifications for him and we're told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns back towards Nabi Adam with mercy and that he grants his, his, his request for istighfar. Now, this raises the question, therefore, if Nabi Adam alayhi salam, if this was a punishment for a sin and Nabi Adam alayhi salam was uh, the, 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 the being thrown out, of the garden, uh, the, uh, thrown out of the garden, then how come once Nabi Adam alayhi salam comes into earth and does istighfar and this is accepted, does he not get returned back into the garden? Because from an Islamic point of view, from a Sharia point of view, if somebody commits a sin and then they do tawbah and they, and they, and they make istighfar and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns back to them in mercy and grants their request, then it should be as if the sin was never committed. It should be completely wiped out. And yet what we see here is that Nabi Adam alayhi salam does not return back to the garden. So this is the first point. The second one, uh, the second point is that... Um, oh, and on this point here... Um, uh, sorry, the second point is comes from uh, ayah number th- uh, surah, surah al-Baqarah again, and it's ayah number thirty-eight to thirty-nine. So Allah subhanahu wa taala tells us, "Kulna ahbitu minha jami'an, fa imma yatiyannakum minni hudan, fa man tabi'a hudaya, fala khawfan alayhim, walahum walahum yahzunun. Wal ladina kafru wa kathbu bi ayatina, ulaika ashab al-nar, hum fiha khalidun." So this ayah says, we said, get down from here all together. And this refers to Nabi Adam salam and all of mankind. And if there comes to you a guidance from me, then whoever follows my guidance, then no fear shall come upon them, nor shall they grieve. And as to those who disbelieve and belie our signs, then these will be the inmates of the fire, and in it they shall abide. So what we can see here is that in a nutshell, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us now about the sharia, the rules of this earth. So this is after coming out of the garden, Nabi Adam salam comes into the dunya and part of life in this dunya requires that we have rules. It requires that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us certain orders. And if we go against those orders, then we'll be acting unjustly and it requires that we be punished. And this is what we call a sin. But as we can see from the, from the series of events here, that this sharia was not ordained until after Nabi Adam salam left from the garden and came into the dunya. So therefore there's no idea, there's no possibility of Nabi Adam salam having committed a sin before coming into this dunya because the sharia had not yet been ordained. So this is the second point. And the third point, which we'll go into in a bit more detail uh, further on, is the fact that um, Nabi Adam salam um, and, and, uh, and Hawa alayhi salam when we find, when we look into the details, we find that the wrong that they did, because it does mention that there was a wrong done, but the wrong done was to themselves, and the wrong done to themselves was that they, that they took someone else's guidance other than Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and that they caused themselves to come into this dunya and to be tested with hardship and trials, because this was a result of the of the eating of that tree, not a punishment, just a natural result of the eating of that tree. But the wrong done was to themselves. But this is something which we'll go into in in a bit more detail. Now, on this topic, there's been a number of. Uh, there's a, there's a number of ayat, of ayat which need a bit more explanation. And you know, um, whenever I come um, to lecture, you're never free of getting uh, a, like a, a sort of Arabic kind of linguistical um, lecture. So I apologize in advance. Um, but it is, 
But it is really essential when we read in Quran, you know, to understand the Arabic language that has been used. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, the, the miracle of Islam is the Quran. You know, this is the miracle which we have, the, the miracle which never goes away, which never passes away. It remains a hujja on the whole of mankind forever. And it remains our pure and perfect source of knowledge and guidance for all time. So it's essential that we do at least make the efforts to, uh, to, to try to understand some of the true meanings of what the Quran is saying. Now this doesn't, obviously, ideally, inshallah, if we get a chance to go and study Arabic in an Arabic country and we can work on, work, you know, pursue that goal, then this is an excellent aim. And I would encourage everyone um, to go out and if you get a chance to do that, it's absolutely amazing. But on the other hand, if you can, if anyone here can just, if we can just read Arabic and we can understand Arabic and we get a knowledge, a basic knowledge of the alphabet, nowadays, alhamdulillah, when I was researching this topic, some of the resources which are available for Quranic dictionaries, for somebody who knows the Arabic dictionary and can search for words in a Quranic dictionary from Arabic into English, there are now some, some resources. For example, I'll give one for anyone who's keen to, to look into this. Um, if you just go onto Google and you type in Quranic dictionary, um, the second link which comes up refers you to um, alislam.org, a PDF file from alislam.org. And it's an excellent, excellent uh, dictionary which gives you the root meanings, the usages of every single word. And because what, what you'll find is so often when people, when there's misunderstandings in the religion, when there's misunderstandings by both Muslims and non-Muslims, so often this comes from language, from just a, 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 a misuse of a word or a mistranslation or a misplacement uh, of a word. So it is incredibly important that we, that we, that we pursue this study. But the first ayah in this respect which I want to talk about is from Surah Taha, ayah number 121. And this is another place which uh, talks about this, this, this issue. And it says, وَعَسَىٰ آدَمْ رَبَّهُ فَغَوَىٰ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Nabi Adam asa rabbuhu. So this is often translated as disobeyed his Lord. Ma'asiyah comes from the, same, uh, from the same root. And we understand a ma'asiyah to be like a sin. Um, you know, this is how we understand it, a disobedience towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then it says, Fagawa. And then this will be translated as so he went astray. So immediately, um, the, the question is, surely here it's telling us that Nabi Adam sinned. The answer to this lies in the language. The verb asa does not mean to sin. The verb asa means to resist or to refuse to yield. If those two are, are different in meaning. So for example, you can say that a stick, if you tried to break it, but you couldn't, you can say that the stick is doing this verb, asa, it won't snap, it won't break. <laughs> the same thing can be used um, to mean rebellion, to mean re revolt, to mean a sin, in a sense when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a law and we break it, we're refusing to, will to, to, the will of Allah, to yield to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it also has many other meanings. So for example, uh, from the same root, you get the, ver the, the verb when you get a, a, a disease and it can't be cured. Or when you get a task and it's so difficult that you can't complete it. You can say you can use different variations of this verb asa because the meaning is to resist. Now in the same way as the Arabic and in, in the same way in the Arabic as it works in the English, you can say to resist good advice. You can say you can say to resist good good guidance. So the fact that the word asa is used here does not mean that Nabi Adam salam sinned at all. And the word rawa, rawa literally means to go astray in a sense that you harm yourself. In a, in a way that is not beneficial to you. Otherwise, sometimes translated as meaning um, an inability to look after yourself, an inability to take care of your own affairs. Um, a classic example would say, for example, say for example, if you were heading in the in the middle of a desert towards a well, and you went to you went astray. You went, you, you tried to find your own route. You went off on your own, and you went astray, and you missed it, and you would perish and die in a desert. Okay, because you went off the route, and you're unable to look look after yourself by your own means. So this is the word for rawa. Okay. So we can see here that Nabi Adam salam did, yes, take his own route. He did go against the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Asa here does not refer to him sinning. It refers to his resisting of good advice. Um, because as mentioned, as we'll see, the wrong which was done by him eating from the tree, we'll come back to this point again after, was a wrong done to himself. Um, but the next, word, the next idea which I wanted to, uh, the next ayah which we need to look into is Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 35. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَقُلْنَا يَا آدَمْ أَسْكَنُوا أَنْتَ وَزَوْجُكَ الْجَنَّةِ فُكُلَا مِنْهَا رَغَدًا حَيْثَ شِئْتُمَا وَلَا تَقَرَّبَا هَذِهِ الشَّجِرَةِ 
فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us uh, that he told Adam, Oh Adam, stay in this wife, stay in this garden, you and your wife, and eat from it as you will. But don't come near to this tree, otherwise you would be, be, become from among the ظَالِمِينَ now of, of, often, you know, we read in the, in the Qur'an, we read Dhalameen, we assume sinners. That's, what, that's, that's, that's you know, the, the, the unjust or, the, you know, the oppressors. Um, the word Dhalama means to literally put something in its wrong place. So it can be mean even if, 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 for example, in a valley, water reaches a place where it's never reached before. The word Dhalama can be used to explain this concept because the water has reached a place where it should not be. And this, from this meaning, we get the idea that it's a wrong done because something has been done in a way that it shouldn't have been done. If, if, if you take someone's right away from them, so if you take someone, if you steal from somebody or you, do, or you commit a crime, then you have wronged them. You've done something unjust against them. But in the same way, you can have a, you can have a wrong done, a dhulam, against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this would be a sin. You can have a dhulam done against another person, another creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this can also be a sin. Or you can have a dhulam done against yourself, and this is on your own self, this is your, this is your own loss. Um, and we're told further down in this ayah um, that, 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 that um, Nabi Adam says, dhulamana and fusana. Okay, so it's made clear to us that this, this dhulam which is talked about is a dhulam against Nabi Adam's own self, and this is explicit in the Quran, so we can understand this. Um, and finally, on this on this topic on, on, of the of the kind of textual examination, um, there's a narration from Imam Rudd alayhi salam. And he had a debate, you know, uh, with some Christians, some Jews, some Sabians. Um, so very kind of relevant to this conversation, um, and. Imam Rudha salam says, As for the words of Allah, and, and, and Adam obeyed, disobeyed his Lord so he got astray, فَعَسَى رَبَّهُ فَغَوَى The fact is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created Adam to be his proof on earth. So going back to this point, that, that Imam Rudha says, No, Nabi Adam salam was created for this earth, and to be his vigerant in his towns. He had not created him for the garden, and the disobedience was done by Adam in the garden and not in the earth. And the disobedience came to pass so that the measures of the so that the measures of the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might be fulfilled, as in mankind would come into this earth. The reason for, for Ad, Nabi Adam salam, eating from the tree is so that this decree that man would be the Khalifa in the earth would be fulfilled. So when he was sent down to the earth and was made Allah's uh, Allah's proof and vi- vicegerent, he was protected after that point. You know, he became sinless, became ma'asum. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surely Allah chose Adam and Nuh, and Nuh and the descendants of Ibrahim and the descendants of Imran above all the worlds. So again, another ayah from the Quran which talks about the guidance offered by these great prophets. So, this is quite, you know, this is quite a heavy, I appreciate for a Tuesday evening, a warm evening, kind of look into the text and the Arabic language. But what does this mean philosophically? What's the importance? Why do we, why do we care if, if Nabi Adam sinned when he ate, the, ate, ate from his tree or whether it was a wrong done to himself, a slip or whatever we might call it. Why does it actually matter to us? Now, I think the first point is that this is a fundamental belief of the school of Ahlul Bayt <coughs> um, and this is linked to the, the concept of the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send down messengers who could sin and who could, who could break their own, the, the, the rules and the laws which they're bringing, then what, the, what hujja is that on us? Why should we follow? Okay? So this is the first significance of this. And secondly, there's a personal significance. How do we view ourselves? What do I think of, 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 of my own self? And we're going to see the different ideas which have come out of this idea of the sin of Nabi Adam. But let's first of all look at the, let's first of all look at the, at the Islamic concept of the, of the creation of each person. See, we're told in, uh, in Surah, al, uh, Surah Al-Teen, لَقَدْ خَلَقَنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ taqweem. We have created mankind in the best of standing. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us, uh, gives us a great, um, what's the word I'm looking for, like karama, like he's, uh, gives us a great description. You know, he's very kind to us. He tells us, I've created you in the best of standing. We have in Islam this fundamental belief that every single baby, every single person when they're born, is born on this pure fitra. Our nature, our inherent nature is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, and... And 
Anything which takes us away from that is unnatural for us. And this is something which really should go into the, our understanding of the purpose of our own being. You know, this is the chance which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. This is the form in which we were created. This is what we were created for. And then, if we look at, uh, if we look, if we look at the, the comparative of what some of the different ideologies have, have come out with from this idea of the, of the, of the sin of Nabi Adam alayhi salam, we take for example the, the Christian theologian Augustine. Now he was, he, he was writing in around 400 years AD. And he is one of the fundamental theologians who has really underpinned the Christian belief today. I mean, his, 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 his teachings are followed, if not directly, but they have had a huge influence on many of the doctrines which are, which are believed by, like I said, by one third of the world's people today. Now, he took from this story, he took from the, from the version in Genesis of this, of this account of this occurrence, he took from this that actually Nabi Adam salam committed a grave sin. It was a sin of the flesh. It was done by temptation. It was done by desire. And then what happened from there is because Nabi Adam salam was the first man, this was transmitted down from Nabi Adam to all other future generations, to each and one and every one of us. And this was done through the sexual desire, through the sexual urge. So the, 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 the conclusion that he reached is that, is that mankind is a condemned crowd, a condemned mass, all of us. We have some free will, but it's been greatly damaged by the sin of Nabi Adam, alayhi salam, you know. Um, and so therefore, we're really inclined towards sin, we're inclined towards uh, corruption. Um, it's really quite a negative outlook of, of ourselves, it's really quite a negative outlook of the world. Um, one, 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 one consequence of this is that Augustine, in his writing, said that if a baby died before it was baptized, then that baby would go to hell and would burn in hellfire, you know, as a consequence of this. Um, so if we compare this, you know, and this, this, these kind of beliefs, these, these, this belief in original sin today is followed by the majority and permeates through the, the most of, of Western Christianity, you know, in different forms. Um, so perhaps you'd find Protestantism probably sticks closer to, the August, to Augustine's writings. Catholicism might be slightly different from this, but in all of the Western churches, you would, you would find some form of belief in original sin to some extent, coming from this idea of Prophet of Nabi Adam salam having sinned. So, this is an extremely important difference between the Quranic version and the version which we find in, in Genesis, and we can see that from that difference flows an entire different understanding of the nature of mankind and the way in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us and the favor and benefits upon which he has poured upon us. Um, now, the, the last point, okay, so if we, sorry for the pause. <laughs> um, if we're talking here about the, to, to tie in a, an Islamic concept here and we can see how this relates. Here we're told that you know all of mankind is is born in sin. Islamically, we're told that actually man was created fi ahsin taqwin. But at the same time, we we know here that Nabi Adam alayhi salam did have was created with desires. He was created with free will. He was created with the ability to disobey Allah subhanahu wa taala. And for this reason, we're told that when mankind comes down into the earth, he's been given this Sharia, and this follows on uh, in Surah uh, Al. This follow, this follows on from the Quranic. Um, version of this of this event. We're told that once Nabi Adam alayhi salam came onto the earth, the Sharia was ordained. So we so we know from a, from a, from an Islamic perspective, we have materialistic tendencies, we have dunyawi tendencies, but these are to be confined within the limits of the Sharia. And as long as they are confined within the limits of the Sharia, then they are good. You know, for example, sexual desire within the marriage is a positive thing. The desire to earn wealth. To the extent where you're feeding your, yourself and your family and you're providing a modest living is to be recommended, you know, to go out to work. And so this is why we find, you know, this sometimes may seem quite abstract looking at these different words and different concepts which are coming out of these tendency, uh, coming out of these verses. But you'd find, for example, in, in, in Christianity over the years, you've had concepts such as um, the, 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 the idea of monks who stay away and have no material possessions, you know. Um, where you find, for example, the idea of abstinence of, of nuns and priests who can never have any sexual relation. Um, you find uh, concepts of, of complete pacifism in the face of, of invasion, in the face of oppression, in the face of anything, to remain pacifist. And this comes from the concept, if we start to understand that 
the version that we the, 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 from the teachings of Augustine and we go back into the version of the of the of, of the story of, of Prophet Adam from Genesis, we see that actually we can understand why some Christian people have taken this approach that actually to have to listen to your desires or to have any kind of material functioning is to be seen as a negative thing. But Islam, Alhamdulillah, has always taught us to have a balance, has always taught us to have these to to to, to, to live within the boundaries of the Sharia and to also have the higher spiritual ability as well, which uh, Nabi Adam alayhi salam was obviously also gifted with. So given that we said that Nabi Adam alayhi salam was not created, uh, did, did not sin. So how are we supposed to understand? What was the purpose? If we, say, if we see from different ideologies, okay, the purpose of this whole, we take from this, what was the whole point of this story? The point was, is that Nabi Adam alayhi salam sinned, we all inherited that sin, we all got put onto the earth, and that's the, the point of this story. Islamically then, if there's no sin, if the idea of coming into earth wasn't a punishment, what is the point of the story? Um, the way, that this, the way that the Qur'an presents this, and the way that, 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 that we should understand this, is that this is the educative process for Nabi Adam alayhi salam before he enters dunya. If we think about it, every single person in dunya, we can all look back to previous generations. We all had prophets who came before us, we had books that went before, we have knowledge passed down. Nabi Adam alayhi salam was the first to enter into the dunya, and to live in this material world, and to have the potential to be misguided. So for this reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, brought Nabi Adam alayhi salam into the dunya via this process. Via this process which taught Nabi Adam a number of things. For a start, Nabi Adam alayhi salam has never been approached, had never been even exposed to the idea of sin. So when the, the when Iblis appears and, and says, you know, I'm a sincere advisor to, advisor to you, the best thing for you to do is to go ahead and eat from that tree. Nabi Adam alayhi has not seen any has not seen any sin, any lying, anything before. So how is he supposed to be educated about the be educated about the potential to be misguided by, by iblis before he enters into dunya, <clears throat> and this is done in the garden before he enters into dunya. This is done where there is no where there is no sin attached to uh, to, to, to to that listening to iblis because to punish Nabi Adam in, in to to make this a uh, an offence which would be a sin would be unjust on Nabi Adam alayhi salam before he had had any concept of 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 wrong or anything which wasn't perfect. So this is the first. Point to be taken. The second point is that actually, if we look deeper into the story, we can find that everything we need to know in life is contained in here. Because Nabi Adam alayhi salam, the first thing he does, he's created in fi'asin taqwim. He's living in the garden, where there's no, there's, there's, he's following Allah's guidance 100% purely. There's no kind of rawaya. Uh, there's no kind of being misled at all. But then he listens to the advice of the shaitan. And he goes against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance. But what, the, what happens then is he realizes what he's done. And so he does tawbah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches Nabi Adam how to do tawbah. And there's, no, there's narrations mentioning how the tawbah was done. There's different, uh, there's different du'as which are narrated. And particularly uh, the du'as which mention um, that Nabi Adam um, made, uh, asked for shifa'a through, through the um, holy five of the Prophet's household. So this is, one, uh, this, is, this is one aspect. But just on a conceptual basis, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed Nabi Adam, okay, once this happens, once you have gone astray, the next step to take is to do tawbah. And the next step after Nabi Adam did this tawbah, the next thing which happened, immediately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned back to him with guidance and uh, with mercy. And then what happened immediately after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you go down into the earth and I will send you guidance. So this is, from this point we can see that the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a mercy on us, is a mercy. And the tawbah of, and, and the tawbah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a pure mercy on us. And really, really, really and truly, this is all that a person needs to be aware of in the life going back towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To be aware that the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the pure guidance. To be aware when we have actually gone against it because sometimes we can be negligent and we don't realize and we don't think and we're just acting without thinking. But we can see that Nabi Adam alayhi salam was cognizant, knew that he'd gone astray. And secondly, uh, and, and finally to know that the door of tawbah is always open and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always there and will always guide us and will always bring us back. Um, Another point coming out of this story 
I mean, I say story just in a, in a loosely using that word. Obviously, we believe this is an account of, a, of, a, of an actual event. Um, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Nabi Adam the ability to understand his material tendencies, the ability to be misled. Now, this is of, uh, as well as his spiritual tendencies. And he gave him an understanding of the battle between the two. And this is something of immense uh, practical consequence for us in our lives today. Because we're all faced with this. We're all faced with a constant battle between right and wrong. Um, and so as we can see, wrapped up, in this, wrapped up in, this, in this event was the entire education of Nabi Adam and everything which he needed um, to, 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 to come onto this earth. Now, the final, the final lesson to take from this um, is the danger of forgetting the, 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 the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Surah Taha Ayah 115 says, وَلَقَدْ أَحَدْنَا إِلَىٰ آدَمْ مِنْ قَبْلَىٰ فَنَسِيَىٰ وَلَمْ نَجِدْ لَهُ أَزَمَىٰ So this is saying that certainly we, co- we made a covenant with Nabi Adam before, but he forgot. And this was the whole reason why this all happened, because Nabi Adam Islam forgot the covenant. Now the Mufassirin, in talking about what this covenant was, come to the conclusion that this is talking about a covenant which is taken with all of mankind and with those uh, prophets in particular not to forget the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is essential in our lives because we can see that the difference between people I mean all of us, all of these people in this, in, this, in this country, in this world we all live in the same world we're faced with similar experiences we're faced with similar tra- challenges, hardships and yet we find that those who always have the, who maintain the, the dhikr of Allah, the those who recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything, those who never forget Allah's lordship, who never forget the fact that Allah has the complete sovereignty over everything, they recognize the world in a different way than we do. They recognize the world in a way that, that you, can, you, can, you can see the, 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 the contentment in the heart of a true mu'min, the contentment that lies in the fact of knowing, of knowing that actually everything is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will all return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that the whole purpose in our lives is only for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with this in mind you know this is this is like it's in the Quran this is this is what is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran this is what gives the the believer the heart of the believer this mutmain you know this uh, tranquility is this constant dhikr and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and there's a, there's a few other there's a few other points to mention on the topic um, if we're going to do looking at a, a pure comparison between um, between the the bi- biblical version and the Quranic bi- version um, I mean one is another another one it's, it's going slightly sort of uh, off topic but another just 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 before I finish um, a couple of points which I noted just as I was reading through um, one of them is that um, when when Nabi Adam alayhi salam, after he's eaten the fruit in the garden and he's walking in the garden, we're told that, um, that, 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 he heard, that he heard the Lord God walking in the garden. Now again, from the previous, from the previous lectures looking at the concept of Tawheed, obviously this is something which we would never accept, the fact that you know, Nabi Adam would be walking in the garden, hear God walking in the garden. And it says that God asked him, did you eat from the fruit and uh, so on. Um, another point coming out of the story is that when Nabi Adam alayhi salam, is asked, did you eat the fruit? He says that you gave me uh, Eve to be my companion in this life and she gave me the fruit so therefore in a way not only does Nabi Adam commit a sin in, the, in, in that version but when he's questioned about it he goes on to blame uh, Eve so there's many kind of, there's many issues here and there's many we, we can see with these all of these kind of any kind of logical difficulty when you read the, the Genesis version you think this doesn't really make sense we find that the, that the Qur'an comes and it confirms certain parts and certain parts are not present. Certain parts are similar but slightly different. But what we find with the Qur'anic version is that it comes in such a pure form that when you really delve into it, when you really look deeply into it, all, it, all that you come back with is a stronger faith, you know. You come back with a stronger sense of iman and a stronger sense of purpose. Um, another version, um, I'm just, just thinking off the, off the top of my mind having read this, um, Another another point from the from the from the Bibli- from the Genesis version is that is that Nabi Ad- is that we're told that God tells uh, Nabi Adam alayhi salam that do not eat from this tree, otherwise you would surely die. Now, of course, this is of this is of this is of great significance because then Nabi Adam alayhi salam did eat from the tree and didn't die. 
Um, whereas the whereas the whereas the, the, the devil in the Genesis version tells Nebi Adam that if you eat from this tree, you would gain the knowledge of good and evil, and that is in fact what happens. Um, you know, so we can see that in in the biblical version, there's a problem in that what Shaitan says is true, and what God supposedly tells Nebi Adam turns out to be false. Um, but again, I mean, I think the important point is not to try to sort of slam other people's religion or try to you know try to sort of get one over if you like the idea here is to try to understand how it is that the quran comes as a confirmer and as a guide um and as 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 you know to, to set straight what had come beforehand um and it's in, very interesting if we can look into these topics if we do get a chance to discuss um with any christians um or or, or jews on this topic um, because of course we should be having these conversations because the Christians and the Jews, you know, we should initially see them as our brothers, you know, at least having a faith in, 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 in the God, having a common sort of ancestry and believing in many of the same prophets, even if we have some fundamental differences in our belief as well, um, at least in an environment such as this. Uh, when you find many people just laugh or you know become quite abusive against even the idea of a concept of God, you know, if we can study these 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 these, these similarities we have as well as the differences between Christianity and Judaism and have these constructive conversations, then this would inshallah be of great benefit um, to all of our communities. Um, we, uh, says Surah Al Fatiha, um, and after a uh, bit before it allowed us salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah, 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 Allah.